today's date is July the 29th, 2013. We're interviewing Alicia K. Uh, T. Fertiller. Did I get that right? T. Fertiller, yes. who is uh, a member of the Pawnee Nation. And is there any other tribal? Uh, just all Pawnee? Uh, no, there's no okay. other. Of the Pawnee Nation. We're doing the interview at the Oklahoma Historical Society in Oklahoma City, and this is Bill Welke for the Historical Society. Uh, Miss T. Fertiller, would you please tell me where and when you were born? I was born at the Pawnee Indian Health Service Hospital in Pawnee, Oklahoma, on November 26, 1950. 1950. So one day off from my mother's birthday, <laughs> 27. Um, and could you give me the name of your parents and your mother's maiden name, please? My mother was um, Malvina Fields. That was her, that's her that's whole her name, name. Okay. Uh -huh. and she married my father Ralph L. T. Fertiller Jr. <coughs> Excuse me. And and they were both Pawnee themselves. My mother was full blood. My father was half. So I that see. makes me three fourths. Three fourths. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well now, uh, and your grandparents. Okay, my grandparents on my mother's side were Clarence and Katie, Clar Clarence and Katie Tilden Fields. Um, and my father's mother was uh, Alice Leader, and my grandfather was Ralph L. T. Fertiller Sr., a non-Indian. Okay. And, that, and That's where the T. Fertiller comes from. I see. <laughs> what nationality is that? Do you know? My grandfather told me that it was uh, German, but it was the Black Dutch that escaped the regime. Oh, okay. And he also told me that T. Fertiller means bowl and spoon in that language. Really? Now that was when I was like 10 or 11 years old. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. And it stuck with me ever since, you know, that my name is a, a bowl and spoon. <laughs> <laughs> well now, um, where did you go to school? Uh, well, do you, where in Pawnee? Do you live in the town of Pawnee? Yes, or? I live outside, west of Pawnee, uh, out by the, the old cell barn, okay. you know, and um, out by the old Echohawk home, okay. the mansion, I see. <laughs> and it's about two and a half miles west of Pawnee, right. and my mother inherited some land from my other grand, one, you know, Pawnees, we have a lot of grandmothers, grandfathers, aunts and uncles. Well, my mother used to take care of my um, grandmother, oh God, Gertie Clark, okay. and her maiden name was White. And um, she used to take care of her, take her into town, you know, get groceries, whatever she wanted. And she ended up deeding some land to her. And that's where my mother ended up deeding me that, that land before she passed. And um, that's where I live now, on a trailer, in a trailer home. Okay. So, well now, was this part of an original allotment? I uh, that was believe done? so. I, I cannot figure out who... Um, Oh, I knew that. I had that name earlier, but I can't. Um, Fontanelle was the name on it before mm. Grandma Gertie got it. Okay. And I have researched it, but I don't think I've researched it enough. But now I might be able to find out through you. Well, <laughs> we do have allotment records for the various tribes, largely because of the Jerome Commission that came in and right. forced the various uh, tribes in Oklahoma during that time period in the 1890s to take up allotments and severalty and and uh, and then any surplus lands were then thrown open to the non-Indian population right. depending on land runs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so uh, yes, uh, unfortunately yes, we'll be able to help you <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, nail down uh, some of that information. Good. Um, and you went to school in Pawnee then? Right. Well I was, um, before I was born we lived in Wichita. My dad worked up there as a painter on the oil in the oil fields, the tanks, and that that was my father's trade. That and a, a hunter <laughs> and a fisherman, and um, but we lived up there. And then I was the my favorite story is how he got me down to how he got my mother and I down to Pawnee was he borrowed my uncle's car who was a policeman up in Wichita, and um, we got so far out of town had a flat. I mean, I don't remember this, but <laughs> I was told. <laughs> and so he had to hitchhike back. They weren't too far out of Wichita. 
So they got, he got the tar fixed, came back, and mom was not in labor, but she thought she was. <laughs> oh. Oh. So we ended, and it was snowing. So winter is my favorite time of the year. <laughs> um, he hitched right back, got the tar fixed, and then we had it on back to Pawnee. And they put her in the hospital. She was in there for a whole week, and then she had me. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. And my grandfather, well, I'm just going to take off. Sure. <laughs> my oh. grandfather, Clarence, they called Click Fields, mm -hmm. and he's the one they, they named the, hot, the road for out there at the agency. And they live right off, like when you go to the new clinic out there, there was an old establishment, two-story house that they lived in. <clears throat> My mother wasn't raised there. My mother was nine months old when my grandmother, Katie, gave her to my auntie, Aunt Lucy Washington Tilden. And Aunt Lucy Washington Tilden came from Nebraska when she was nine years old. She'd made the trek from Nebraska to Oklahoma. She was uh, 109 when she passed away. Yeah, so I'm related to the Tildens and the Phils and the leaders. It's a good triangle. <laughs> now, when did when did she pass? She was 109. When what? When did she? I think pass it was in 1975. I'm not. Sh I can't remember that date, but um, she, I don't know when she was born. It just says on her headstone. It just says born in Nebraska. I see. And so she was. Of, so she made that um, the Pawnee tra Trail of Tears uh, mm -hmm. and. Can you talk, did, did you hear any stories that were passed down from uh, any of the family members that might have talked about that? Or, no, I, or any impressions of Nebraska? No, uh, but the one regret about knowing Auntie Tilden was I didn't listen to the Pawnee language that she was talking to me on the front porch. I mean, so I remember her saying, Nitikawita all the time, meaning Henri, meaning me. <laughs> <laughs> Or bad, bad girl, or you know. But I never heard her say Judy Keat with that. I just heard her say Nita Gawita, and um, I don't know if you know. She only spoke Pawnee then. Yeah, and Mom did too. I see. You know because she'd go out there and they'd visit and everything, and they'd be talking in Pawnee, and I didn't listen. I, and I was the oldest for six years. Oops. And um, you know I should have I should have paid attention, but and Mom didn't correct me and make me pay attention. She just let me you know go about my go climb the tree or whatever, the big cedar tree out in the front. So, But I always enjoyed those visits, but that's my regret, is that I didn't learn that language thoroughly. But some of it I can understand. Well, I suspect if you had been um, left in the care of your grandmother for any length of time, you would have mm -hmm. been conversant. Well, in, that in, was my mother's grandmother. That was your mother's grandmother? So she, you know, Pawnee way. <clears throat> like I've tried to teach my, my children and other Pawnee people, this is the way the Skeeties did it, I've been told, is that <clears throat> my mother's mother, of course, is my grandmother. Any of her children are my aunts and uncles. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, their children would be our grandparents. I see. So, and I asked Mom why, why we did that, and she said, because Auntie said this is the way, Auntie Tilden said this is the way that we kept our tribe alive, you know, so we, if I was to pass away, you would have somebody to turn to, mm -hmm. to care for you, to teach you, and all of this. So that's how I, you know, I've told my kids, this is the way you, you have to do when you're, you're in Ro Pawnee, you're skeedy. Mm -hmm. And another thing, I am skeedy, I'm, I know that I'm a pumpkin vine and camps by river clan, both clans, those clans only, that I know of. I mean, I wasn't told any different. Mm -hmm. And Nora, Grandma Nora Pratt is my grandmother. That's my mom's mother's sister. And, and was she someone who was very influential in your life? Mm -hmm. She was. She was one that taught me to. And, you know, I would go out there and stay, you know, just during the day. And uh, she would teach me, you know. I mean, and I didn't learn the language from her either. We just didn't. I'd stay for like one day or something like that, you know, and then mom would come and pick me up. And I wish she had just left me, you know, for a whole week. <laughs> but wish. she was telling, but she was passing on uh, information about the Pawnee way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she would, t you know, if I'd do something wrong, she'd always correct me. And um, out there to the house, and I may get in trouble for telling this, but there's, hard, there's no 
children's left except two uncles, three uncles. And um, we had a sacred bundle out there to the house, to the old house out north of town, out by the lake. And um, she always told me, do not, you can go in that room, but do not touch that bundle. So I never did myself, but I heard that one time somebody did, some children did. Oh, really? um, and she had told me that they had done that and they got in trouble mm -hmm. and didn't have good luck after that because they weren't supposed to open it. Mm -hmm. So, but that bundle went with my, I think it went with Grandma Nora when she was buried. I'm pretty sure it did, not unless my aunt has it. I'm not sure. Well, now that's, that's something I know of various tribes. <coughs> they've protected the bundle with certain mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. and that only certain people could were, open it. Could open it and uh, I know that that's very sacred thing, right. and an important thing for mm -hmm. each of the tribes. But you did actually get to see it, though, right? Oh, yeah. I saw it every time I went to the bedroom. See. You know, I just look at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't even dare touch it, you know. Was it, do you, do you recall if it was uh, uh, with buffalo skin or cow I, skin? Or you... I think it was with buffalo, because I'm pretty sure it came with uh, Auntie Tilden from Nebraska. Mm. I'm pretty sure it did. Have you gone back to Nebraska yourself to, to see some of the areas where your ancestors lived? I have. I've um, two years ago this past uh, this past uh, two years ago in November, my cousins on my dad's side, they had never been to Nebraska, never knew about their roots, mm -hmm. and so you know their ancestors or anything like that. So I made arrangements with the people I knew up there because I did an internship up there on uh, excavating. Uh, what they, it was, let me start all over. Uh, we did an internship up there with the museum. <coughs> and we did this in Omaha because this gentleman had bought this land and they were clearing it out and they came upon artifacts. Really? In, uh, what do you call them? The pits. The pit they found man. some pits. They don't know if it was an Omaha village or Pawnee village, but they kind of think it was more, leaning more towards a Pawnee village. Yeah. And um, so we, they were, we were asked to go up there for a whole week, well, a week and a half, really. And um, it was myself and two younger uh, Pawnee members, uh, boys, you might say. <laughs> they were just out of high school and into college. So, you know, they went up there, too, and we just, oh, it was very interesting. It was just really informative. And um, we got to dig in the, in the pits and... My partner and I, um, I can't think of his name right now. Anyway, he and I, we found a, a um, deer horn yeah. that they probably used to scrape, you know, the, the fat off of the skin and stuff like that. And then we found a bunch of copper beads. Mm -hmm. Copper beads and what else did we find? No, that, that was basically it. We didn't find anything really big or, you know, exciting. But still, but it, it, it's significant to find those kinds of artifacts. Exactly. It was, it was a lot of fun. But back to me, me and my cousins now. We went up there two years ago. I think it's been two years ago. <coughs> and um, I made arrangements with, um, oh, I can't even think of her name. But we went downtown, uh, downtown Genoa. And that's the basic area where we went because... Uh, when I did my internship, they took us out there and they showed us the area that, of a village where you could see the indentions of the roundhouses, you know, the earth lodges. And, uh, but someone owns that land now, so we couldn't go out there and see it when we went up there. And it was hunting season too, and she didn't want us to get hurt. So she just pointed out where they were. But I have pictures of that area. And it, I don't know how an enemy could get up to an earth lodge. It was so steep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was really steep. Well, now the, the um, so I take it that the private property is owned by a non-Indian then? Very much so. Um, that's too bad. And probably does not have any respect for any... No, he, he allows them to go out oh, he there. Oh, does he? Okay. He, ha he did when I went on my internship, but I don't know if that's changed. <clears throat> he might want to sell it for a million dollars like they want to do Wounded Knee. <laughs> well, I, anything they think is historical, they're going to try to get the oh, yeah. It's an unfortunate aspect, I'm afraid. But when I, the, when I went with my cousins, we went to a different area. I mean, the area where she took us, took 
the lady took us was at least 150, they th thought, Earth Lodge Village. Really? And it was south of that particular place I was talking about. And uh, you couldn't see the indentions, but I'm sure if, if you really, you know, did a map and looked at a map, you probably could see them. Mm -hmm. But we walked out there in the field and we didn't find anything, but it was, it was just a calming, for me it was a very calming time. And I could, um, I could relate to that. I mean, at one time, I, I, I told my, my Sioux sister, I said, I think I was um, a Sioux that was incar incar incarcerated, not incarcerated, mm -hmm. reincarnated <laughs> into a Pawnee. She, we both just laugh, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, but we're really close, she and I. And when we went up to her hometown, it just felt natural to be there. So, you know, I had that type of thing going on. With the when you have this this innate feeling and, and closeness <coughs> to mm -hmm. the area and uh, also to your ancestors who were Very there so. and, and felt a closeness to them. Yeah, I felt like they were there, so maybe they might have been waving at me and I didn't see them. <laughs> well, well, now um, I take it then because of your your um, influence of both your grandmothers and uh, telling you. Uh, some stories and, mm -hmm. and also correcting you as mm -hmm. on some things that you have uh, continued to uh, come acquainted more and more with uh, Pawnee history in right. a variety of ways and right. uh, and of course they don't unfortunately in Oklahoma they don't teach Oklahoma history very well they no. certainly don't emphasize Indian history at all mm -hmm. very little and it's uh, it's a very sad commentary. Yes, it is. On the state of, of the historical significance of the contribution of the tribes to Oklahoma. And, uh, but what has, what have you done to learn more about your people? Well, I used to visit with my grandmothers, not only Grandma Nora and Auntie Tilda, but my other grandmothers, my aunts, um, where I live out there by the in my trailer home down the road is where my grandma Gertie used to live and out there is where you know they used to have their sacred dances and there is an area that my my cousin inherited that home but she that homestead but she's deceased now so they had just built a new home there for her and her family and no none of her family lives there my cousin lives there now and um, but on the east side of the house oh I would say about a hundred feet over or maybe 200, there's uh, an area where they used to have the dances and um, they had the sacred dances like the bear dance that we don't do anymore and because um, there's no one to teach us how, you know, how to perform the dance and um, let's see, then they used to have hand games out there, you know, my, my grandmother Gertie loved to play hand games and so yeah. did my mom, well my whole family does. Uh, on so my mom's. you still pick, you still do that? Oh Does yeah. That talk to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, good. And um, that particular, and then, then they say where my trailer home is, that it used to be a dance area, but I've never, I don't remember that. I remember going to my grandma's house and then going back in the woods back there. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember the front part ever being a place where they dance, but my cousins say it is, so I guess mm -hmm. they remember. <laughs> Are they slightly older? Just one. The other one's younger than me. I see. Okay. But um, she says that we did, and she remembers it. But I don't. I don't remember that part. And we, I went everywhere with my mom. You know, from when I was born till I was six years old, when my sister was born. So you know, we went to a lot of hand games and everything. And she, she taught me, you know, how to enjoy that stuff. So, and, and I do. I still do enjoy that. I just hardly ever make it because sometimes I'm sick. <laughs> Yeah. Well, now, didn't the Pawnee just have their, their traditional uh, dances uh, in the first Pow part of this powwow? Pow -wow, the... Yes, they did. That was, um, what was it? It was July the 5th or something like that. Yeah, I, I think it ended on the 5th. I can't remember. 5th, 4th? No, it was on a Wednesday they started. It was the 4th. So it was the 3rd. 1st, 2nd, 3rd. 4th. Okay. 
I don't know. I can't remember. It was early in July. Yeah, it was the late late June. Late June. The last week of June and okay. first part of July. So, anyways, yeah, I can't remember what the dates. I mean, what day it was, but I do. We had a good time at the. Uh, my niece, uh, she always come up with her family, and they camp out to the Pawnee Lake, and we call it um, Camp Fagan because that's her last names, and <laughs> so that's what we've named it. Uh -huh. And we go out there, you know, take our covered dishes and, you know, have a good meal and everything, then go down to the dances and watch the dance. Um, what really inspired me about the Pawnee powwow this year was there were several uh, servicemen that came home. Oh. Yeah, and they honored them. And then they had a, um, an exhibition of the straight dance contest and they were out there, and that was very emotional. It was just really cool. It was really neat, because I can only imagine what it was like the first time that they had this dance, you know, to honor the, the serviceman. And anyway, the, the young man that was out there, he was my uh, granddaughter's classmate. I see. And it was just, it was really neat. I just enjoyed that part. Was he back from Afghanistan? Uh, I'm not Iraq? sure. I'm not sure where he, I think he was just out of uh, training and stuff. I see. So and I didn't know where he was going to be going. And then um, I found out also that my son's cousin is in the military now. He's in the Army, I believe, and he's graduating later this month. I see. So, I mean, from the Army. And he'll be stationed in Afghanistan, too. Oh. <clears throat> but he may not get to go over there because, you know. They're trying to withdraw mm -hmm. the troops, and I think. It's a good idea. Yeah, I think so too. Mm -hmm. um, you you said you went to school in in uh, Pawnee area. Did you go to the high school there as well? I went to the Pawnee Elementary grade school to the fifth grade. My dad was employed with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. He applied for a job at Anadarko, and he got the job at Riverside, oh. in his school, boarding school, and uh, we moved down there. I didn't want to go. I wanted to stay with my aunts in Pawnee, <laughs> but I had to go. That was, I think, 1952. I, no, that wouldn't be right. I was born in 50. <laughs> 62. 62. <laughs> and um, anyway, so we moved down there, and um, my mom got a job out there in the cafeteria. So we became boarding school people. <laughs> Did you and, attend the school there while you were there? No, I didn't. We went to the public school. Oh, did you? Mm -hmm. my, myself, my brother, and my sister. So we went to Sunset Elementary, but all three of us. I see. And we stayed there until I was in the ninth grade. Then he uh, quit. I mean, he didn't quit his job. He applied for another one at Pawnee and got that one. So we moved oh. back to Pawnee, and I uh, didn't want to leave Anadarko. <laughs> Got acquainted with everybody down there. I didn't want to leave at all. So, but we went back, and it was it was okay after a while. But, and I went to the high school there. Graduated in 1969. I see. And um, well, I was supposed to graduate in 1969, even though they had my diplo diploma for me. <laughs> they still gave it to me, but I didn't. Gra I got my GED in 1975. Okay. And I attended um, after my girls were grown. I went back to college in 1997, eight, 1998, went to NOC, Northern Oklahoma College at Tonkawa, got my AA degree, and tried to pursue my bachelor's, but just have not finished it yet. I just have to give myself a swift kick every year. <laughs> well, what, what are your interests? Is it history or, or well, something I, else? Well, at Tonkawa, I majored in Native American leadership, I see. and it was everything that I had having worked with the tribe as a secretary and you know clerk or whatever um, just everything they taught me was what we did mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. at work so it was it was an interesting degree it really was and I want to go back and get my bat, uh, bachelor's in accounting and I just never have pursued it I see I like working with numbers do you mm -hmm. The financial, you could teach me the financial record we have downstairs there. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Because <laughs> the, uh, well now, just a little bit back uh, with your dad being at Riverside, did you ever meet Dorothy Whitehorse? She was a kind of a, a, a mother, um, dorm mother at uh, Riverside. Mm -hmm. I never met her. They may have, but I, you know, okay. I, d I don't remember anyone. Okay. 
but she's uh, still living, but I, she, mm -hmm. she was there for many, many years. She lives there in Anadarko? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. White horse, yeah. It's white horse. I think I went white to white horse DeLon. I think I went to school with some of her children, probably. They have. At, yeah, in Anadarko. About, about your age. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Uh, well, I was just curious, because um, we were interviewing her, too, about Riverside, so mm -hmm. I just found that interesting. Mm -hmm. um, well, now, um, you say you have worked for the tribe, or you still work with the tribe? Yes, I've... Uh, Pawnee uh, tribe, uh, uh, Pawnee Nation. Uh, in, in what capacity? I've been either a receptionist, a clerk typist. I have been an executive secretary before to um, one, two, three, four, four administrations. Really? Yes, and um, let's see, I started out with uh, working for um, the Tommy Chapman administration, <coughs> and then from there I think, uh, gosh, I can't remember who came after, if it was my uncle or not, J Good Fox. I don't remember working for him, um, but I remember working for my other uncle, uh, Dwayne Pratt, and um, then there was my uncle, Teddy Epler. So, you know, I worked for several uncles and administrations, but it's been four administrations that I, I worked. See. Philip Gover was one of them. Okay. So I wasn't the executive secretary then, but I worked in the education department then. And, and, and were these administrations at least four years in, in, in length? Or? Not then. They were just two. Two? Mm -hmm. Are they now four year? I think it's eight, I think. Oh, is it? Okay. It might be four. You might be right. I, okay. I've forgotten. I haven't paid attention. <laughs> okay. Well, and... and when you were an executive assistant, what uh, what were some of the duties that you would have to do? Mm, you know, get the, um, let's see, sometimes I'd type the minutes up for the secretary. Uh, I would get uh, requisitions typed up and, you know, and payment to vendors, uh, answer the phone, and inquiries about, you know, different things, and transfer to whoever they needed to be transferred to make appointments for the president um, and travel arrangements and all, you know, whatever goes along with the mm -hmm. administrative assistant position and try to stay on top of everything and know where everything's at at the same time. <laughs> Which is not always easy to do. No, but... Uh, now, the Pawnee Nation government, uh, has it uh, evolved over time uh, because now tribes are becoming more diversified in their in their um, well, and they're not only their government but also education, but also in business enterprises to mm -hmm. not only employ tribal members but also provide income uh, and resources to mm -hmm. uh, the tribe. And so, uh, what in the years when were you at uh, at the tribal offices? At remember the years. Let's see. I think I started in 1976 or 77 okay. working. That was my first, yeah, because before that I worked in Pawnee but not with the tribe. I applied for the job and Mr. Chapman was nice enough to give it to me. So anyway, um, started there and then I went from the old agency building up to the the new BIA building that they refurbished, but we were just on the north side, mm -hmm. and the rest of the building needed to be refurbished, you know, and they did. Um, I worked there for three years, and then from there we went back over to the, the old go girls' dorm. You, you're familiar with that. And um, I was the receptionist there. Um, my uh, girlfriend, she was my friend. She was uh, my friend. Let's see, Cheryl. I was trying to think of her name. <laughs> she was the executive secretary, and um, I was the receptionist. So, you know, we had a good rapport. We got things done and everything. And anytime anybody needed something, I would always, you know, try to take care of it. I can remember phone numbers from way back then too. Oh, so, really? so see, I love numbers. <laughs> well, now I've been to the uh, tribal headquarters, and some of those buildings are quite old and but unique from the time period when it was the Pawnee Agency. Right. Uh, and I suspect those buildings were probably built either between the 1880s, 1890s, 1900 in some uh -huh. respects, and, but they've held up well mm -hmm. uh, given the, the time frame, but those stone structures are, right. are pretty solid. And, mm -hmm. uh, but the, um, uh, the 
the fact that they've been maintained and uh, continue. There's, I know there's a couple of buildings that need to be restored, mm -hmm. but uh, were you there when they began the process of developing the Pawnee Nation College, or was that after you were there? I see. I joined the Pawnee Nation College after that, after they had been in business, you might say, for three years. They had already established a lot. And, and yeah. so when did you start with them then? I started last August. Last August. Mm -hmm. And that was through a tribal program. Um, it's like a training program, you know, to prepare you to be a receptionist, even though I knew how to be a receptionist, yeah. but, mm -hmm. but um, they needed help. So at first, well, I told them I would just come out and volunteer and because um, I was un unemployed at the time. And somehow I got on this program. I applied for this program, and before I knew it, I was out there working. So I worked from August till February, I think it was, on that 477 program. And it was an educational program. So then from there, I applied for, I'm working on the NICOA program, which is a senior program to train people to, you know, get employment, seniors to get employment. Um, I've been at, on that program since March. I think I worked to the end of February and then started in March. And this is still with the nation college? No. Oh, oh yeah, it's still at the nation, the okay. college, but it's with a different program. Okay. Uh, it's here, located here in Oklahoma City, but the main office is in Albuquerque. I see. So, you know, and I, I got back with them and I go out there four hours a day and do my duties. Well, now, and you say the college itself is about four or five years old now, or is it? I believe it's five. I've, five. I believe. And yeah. uh, and that's kind of a, an interesting aspect that I'm I'm also want to get more information about for the office that I'm dealing with is mm -hmm. the Indian education, uh, as, because there's four colleges that I understand that are in operation in Oklahoma, Pawnee, mm -hmm. um, the Cheyenne mm -hmm. Nation College at. Um, Redlands? Uh, well, no, this is at uh, Weatherford, at Southwestern. Oh, and, okay, okay. And then uh, the Muskogee Creek at Okmulgee, and then Comanche uh, Nation College right. at Lawton. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that's uh, one of the goals that I want to do is to stress the, the, the um, creation of these colleges, mm -hmm. and how they're evolving and, and their programs and I'm sure at some point uh, reaching accreditation uh, so that credits can be transferred to right. other uh, educational institutions. So that's something that I'm very, very interested in wanting mm -hmm. to try to document as that goes along. So mm -hmm. it's kind of in its infancy, but it's growing. Right. Comanche Nation is a, has been around 10 years, and I don't know about the others, but mm -hmm. five for Pawnee. So this is, so, and so I'm glad to get some information about your work right. with mm -hmm. the college itself. And, yeah. About, can you can you recall when you were there about the, the student body, how large it was at the time? Or uh, the beginning, it was I wasn't there, but I believe it was like maybe thirty, 30. maybe twenty five something, twenty five to thirty students, and now it's grown. Uh, Randa would know that information, but I think this past summer we had like forty students, wow. might have been thirty eight, something like that. But we had a big summer school. And the year before, it was a little bit less, you know, and it's, it's growing every semester. It's just really growing. So, mm -hmm. And it's convenient to have the college here. Had I, when I first wanted to go to college, had that been available to me, I would have went there and got my basics out of the way. And um, I, that's what I, you know, some of the students that come in, that's what I tell them, you know, this is the best way to do it is, you know, go to a, a small college, Get your basics out of the way, get it over with, then go on and pursue your, your degree. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of them, they listen, some of them don't. But, you know, it's fun talking to them and encouraging them to, you know, get their education. That's what I have to do to my grandkids all the time. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's so vital mm -hmm. in, in today's society that that education is, is, right. is so important and uh, can't be stressed enough. It can't. It can't be stressed enough. And, you know, my mother never, I'm sorry to say this, but she just, she never encouraged me to go to school after high school. And, of course, I had kids, you know, I was remarried at the time. And uh, <clears throat> we went to Oatmulgee, my ex-husband did, went to the oh, um, 
the school down there at Oatmulgee. Oatmulgee Tech? OST? Yeah, Oatmulgee Tech. Mm -hmm. And he took, um, what was it, auto body. And, you know, had I not had the girl, um, I had the, the oldest one then at the time, had I not had her and had, I, I mean, I could have put her in a daycare. And that's another thing about the students, you know, daycare is a factor where it keeps them from going. And um, had I found a, a good daycare for her, I would have went back. I would have gotten a trade, you know, and I would have gotten through early. <laughs> and you would have enjoyed the accounting, uh, so, because mm -hmm. I would have I'm been. not good with numbers. So <laughs> I, I appreciate those who do, though. Oh, it's, I, uh, it's fun, and that's what I told Randa, my friend Randa, that that's what I want to do, is go back and um, finish finish that bachelor's degree in accounting. I don't lack but just 35 hours and I need to give myself another swift kick here. <laughs> well, and, and if, if you, it's, it's hard to get motivated sometimes. It is and then, you know, transportation, that's a big factor, you know, because now I'm going to have to go to OSU to get that accounting degree. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that OSU has a really good accounting uh, program. So, well, you know. if you can get it, then that uh, and it gives you solid credentials, so you can uh, get a good uh, opportunity for right. a job. Right. So I can go back and be a, the finance director of the Pawnee Tribe. There you go. <laughs> well, and again, with the you know tribal governments are trying to you know build on a basis so they can begin to really uh, diversify and and become uh, much more. Uh, resourceful for not only their people, mm. but f for um, you know outreach within the uh, within the community itself. Right. And there's some tribes that have been very successful at it, and but they've been at it for a while, and then there are others that are still you know getting there. But mm. I think that over time, these resources will be helpful for them and to make those transitions. Yep, it will be. And and I think it's vital that they especially want to train their own uh, yeah. tribal members to so, get that yeah. basic education so they, so they can. can come in and fill those shoes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the, the next generation is is going to be coming up pretty soon and mm -hmm. have to have <laughs> the people there to do it. Right. And once with, um, like I said, common sense is the main thing. I mean, a lot of people step on other people's toes by not having common sense, you know. And it's it's one of my pet peeves. <laughs> Well, now, how many children did you have? Well, um, individually, <laughs> I have uh, my oldest daughter's Risha, my uh, other daughter is Elisa, and they're Pickerings from the Oto tribe, and but they're enrolled with the Pawnee tribe. Okay. Because at the time, their dad and their grandmother, his mom, wanted me to enroll them with the Pawnees because the Otos were not getting anything. And uh, now I wished I had enrolled him with the Otos, <laughs> but I didn't. And then I have a son, Brian, and his last name is Pipestem, and uh, he's an Oto. He's enrolled Oto. I see. And um, my girls say, you know, the girls should have followed their dad. Brian should have followed me, but we didn't do it that way because of what it, their dad told me to do and the grandma. So... But they're still Otos. <laughs> now, is the Pawnee uh, Nation, is it a matrilineal or patrilineal society? Mat. Matrilineal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because it was the earlier interview was patrilineal, and I, I that, that's kind of unusual because most mm -hmm. tribes it's pat, matrilineal. But yeah. Follow. Well, for me, it would be, I I'm, I'm made a mistake there. It would be Pat. It for is the, the girls followed the father, the, and the boys followed the mother. I see. Oh. Right? Yeah. That's okay. it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, now, um, what other aspects, I mean, with your working with the Pawnee Nation, and have you seen the Pawnee Nation grow over, over a period of time? As it's I have seen it. It has really changed, um, especially the, you know, people that are elected. They have uh, longer years to serve now. I'm not sure about how many years each, you know, seat, seat serves in the, the offices. Uh, I just know that the presidency has increased. I know it's more than two years, so it must be four years. And I think they followed like the United States presidency. And um, there, and let's see, um, 
we're still housed in the building 64, but, and we haven't built a new building for anybody to go into. So, but um, I have seen some growth to where they, they've improved, but then there's a lot of dragging their feet too, you know, and they just, to me, they don't, I mean, the other tribes give, um, what do you call them? Uh, per capita. Per capita payments. We have never received a per capita payment at all. Really? Except for this 600 that we, you know, won. And that's not a, really a per capita. That's a, what is it? Uh, the, and An annuity of some kind? No, it wasn't the annuity. It was uh, something else where they won that lawsuit uh, against, uh, oh, I can't even, Salazar? The Salazar. Oh, the, Cabal that, versus Salazar. Yeah. Well, no, no. It was another one. It was a different one than Cobell. Okay. Um, I can't think of what it was. We had, I can't remember what it was. But I know they, they didn't want to give us, we got four million or four, something like that. And I, they didn't want to pay any of the tribal members any money. But they had a big meeting and they ended up, you know, giving us a, a per cap payment. They called it a per cap. Whereas I wouldn't have because it didn't come from money that we earned. It was just like a payment for land that was uh, taken from us, is what I understand. And, uh, you know, we had that given to us once before when I was 13, that was like 1965, I believe. And, <clears throat> no, 1963, 60, might have been 64. <laughs> and um, they gave us a, a Pratt Cat payment. We each got 3000 each for the sale of the land in Genoa. Mm -hmm. and. Um, that's, you know, what we got paid for that. But this last one, I cannot, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it, okay. how, we, how we got that money, but they didn't want to pay us that. But really, I mean, at one time, the Pawnees were really looked up, and, you know, up to as one of the outstanding tribes because uh, we were getting payments from the government for our annuity and stuff like that, whereas the other tribes were not. And it was... Um, at one time, I remember going to the agency and get my my uh, annuity check, which was ninety dollars, and that was like in 1961, mm -hmm. 62, something like that that year. And before we went to Anadarko, and then after that, it's dwindled down. It's nine dollars now. Mm -hmm. That's all we get a year, nine dollars. That is sad. We don't even get a fifty dollar per cap payment from our tribe, mm -hmm. which is I think very ridiculous, but. They have their reasons for it, and I, don't, I have never asked anybody their reasons. So, you know, it's upsetting. It's very upsetting that we're the low man on the totem pole now. You know, just people used to look up to us, and you know, how'd you do that? How'd you do that? I remember these people <clears throat> coming and talking to Mr. Chapman, and uh, <coughs> I worked for Tommy Chapman and Bob Chapman, both. They were brothers. And uh, I remember people asking them, why are you not you know, getting us any money, more annuity payments. <coughs> um, and, um, Can I get you some water? No, I'm okay. okay. It's just my, um, my sinuses. <laughs> okay. And um, anyway, you know, stuff like that. They need to look into that for our, our tribal members. They need to take care of us. How large is the tribe itself? I How believe it's 35 now, 3,500 or 3,300. And Thirty-three dollars. And there's obviously people live outside the, the state as well. But oh yeah, all states. I, <clears throat> I believe so. So, but um, they just my my nephew lives up in Madison, uh, Wisconsin, not Madison, but yeah, it is Madison. <laughs> and um, he can't understand why our tribe is not, you know, with the casinos that we have, why we're not getting money from that entity. And whereas up there in Wisconsin, where is that one? I can't remember that place he goes all the time. And um, it's a casino up there. And Ho-Chunk, that's where he goes, Ho-Chunk. And they pay their, their members $1,500 every month. Oh my God. Yes. And so, you know, for some, that's their income. I mean, that's their monthly income. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he just, I don't know why we can't do that. And I said, well, you just need to write to your president and, you know, Tell them that this is what I think you should do, or you know, give them some type of ideal. Maybe it'll kick in, and maybe they'll they'll start doing that. Maybe they'll have the uh, tribal development corporation get started into looking into that. And it's just 
it's just strange that we don't, you know. Well, it seemed like, uh, I know that it's ambitious <coughs> to get the college going and, and, uh, uh, and other programs, but it seems to me that if the casinos are making uh, some money, do they have other business enterprises besides casinos, like uh, convenience stores or truck stops or anything like Nothing that? like that. Well, I know they, out there they do have that, out to the Stone Wolf Casino. There is a convenience store and, uh, you know, gas station, um, and they have a place for the truckers to stay, but it would be nice if we had a hotel, <laughs> where, mm -hmm. you know, to house truckers and, mm -hmm. you know, different things like, you know, people traveling in the wintertime, when it got bad, they'd have to go on that icy road all the way to Stillwater. <laughs> well, now, where is the casino located? <coughs> it's out on um, Highway 18 and... Uh, Cimarron Turnpike. Well, a prime would, location. It is it in a good like location. It would be a ideal location for a hotel, especially yep. when it's adverse weather and. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, I used to work out there. I had the the main job of uh, bartender. <laughs> well, really? So I've always, you know, it was on my bucket list. <laughs> so <clears throat> I be, I took training out in Albuquerque when I lived out there. I was out there by myself. My girls didn't want to move out there with me, so they ended up staying with my mother. And uh, <clears throat> so to keep myself occupied, I decided to take that training. So I did, but I never got to use it because I came back after nine months because I couldn't stand to be away from the girls that much longer. They didn't want to move out there, so I just figured, well, I'll, I'll make the change and I'll come back. Well, I finally got to put it to use, and this was two years ago when I worked out there as a bartender. And it, it was fun. You make okay. you make a lot of pe friends, and you you, do. you hear a lot of stories, uh -huh. and uh, you put up with some nonsense too. But oh, yeah. Mm, I'm sure you do. yeah, but I had a bully club, so <laughs> <laughs> all I had to do is slam it on the the counter, and yeah, they, they behave. They would mind you, <laughs> or that's tell good. the security guard this guy needs to be gone. Yeah, you know that's I I knew how to handle things. I just wasn't afraid of anybody. That's good. Yeah, but I enjoyed it. I I liked working for the the tribe out there, and then I had to quit because I'm diabetic and got an ulcer and mm -hmm. on my foot, and so that's one reason I had to quit. But I really I really liked it. You know, if I could have been the manager, I would have changed things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, if you if you go back to school and get that uh, accounting degree, then you can. Uh, mm -hmm. Thinking down the road, if you were to become the financial secretary of the of the nation, you would be able to see where the money's going right. to, and see if there's uh, it could be better utilized. Yes, 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 yes. Especially the TDC money. And TD, what is TDC? Tribal Development Corporation, okay. and they're the ones that run the Stone Wolf Casino and the casino in town, the convenience store too. And um, I mean, it it seems to be operating pretty good, but where does the money go? You know, you just, you question, where, where's the mm -hmm. money going? Well, they said they gave the tribe 150000 and they do this every month. Well, why do they need that much? You know, I mean, give the 50000 to the tribal members, and, you know, that's my theory on it, but I'd have to look into it and, you know, make sure I was correct. <laughs> mm. Well, it's, uh, I'm, I don't know enough about the uh, casino operations to know how mm -hmm. how that works, so I can't. I'm sure that they make a fair amount of money. That oh yeah, um, I've heard commercials for a certain casino operation, tribal casino operation, that they at least pay out one percent, mm -hmm. uh, which you know I didn't know if there's the, obviously what percentages are. I, I don't, <laughs> so I'm just uh, I, I don't know enough to. I just need to read up on it to become uh -huh. more familiar with how those things operate yep. and uh, so I can be a little more knowledgeable and right. be able to ask the right questions about mm -hmm. things, about right. those kind of operations. Right. Because it, it is big business in Oklahoma. Yeah, it is. And it was fun working out there in the restaurant part, too. I mean, that was part of the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were the first ones and it, it was interesting. It was something very interesting to me. Like I said, it was on my bucket list. <laughs> well, were, 
were most of the people coming from other locations to come there rather than the community itself? There, there's a lot of people that still come from the community, but mainly Tulsa, Cushing, um, Fairfax, mm -hmm. Stillwater. My brother goes out there every Friday. <laughs> he and his wife, they go to have their weekly meal. Weekly yeah. meal. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and they're, they have a good time when they're out there. So get to see uh, relatives and, and uh, different friends that work out there and uh, friends that come in, you know, and just get to visit with everybody, so. Well now, um, what, what would you like to see uh, as far as the, you know, you just said you'd finish, or you, you're finished reading a, a Pawnee History, and this was by George Hyde. I haven't finished it yet. Okay. I'm still. And, and it's kind of the standard history that was written on the Pawnees. Correct. Um, I have a copy, but I've never read it, so I need to do that. Mm. But uh, but there's been other books that have come out uh, dealing with the Pawnee tribe and uh, and the nation and its op uh, not so much operations, but it's um, some of their uh, history that is always it's it's a tragic mm -hmm. history in a way, and some others it's. And there's still a lot to be written, too. Right. That, there's, that it hasn't been told. Mm -hmm. And um, it needs to be told. And, of course, the, there'll always be, uh, at some point down the road, there'll be the contemporary history they're going to write about today. Mm -hmm. And some of that information uh, needs to be collected somehow right. so it can be preserved. Correct. And uh, it's hoped uh, that, I, with, working with Miranda, that... Uh, the library there at the university at the college will be uh, become a, a good um, resource resource for that. Yeah. The Lane collection that was received, of course, Garland Plain was uh, a hereditary uh, right. chief, a descendant of a hereditary chief. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but Mrs. Blaine, she was not Indian herself, but, right. uh, but she took an avid uh, interest in, in collecting material, but also recording mm -hmm. material, and it's quite a, a, a superior collection, and it's something that I think the Pawnee people at the college will, and the people themselves, the Pawnee people themselves, will mm -hmm. appreciate because there's business committee uh, sessions on those tapes, powwow, mm -hmm. or yeah. interviews with uh, right. um, tribal members that have gone from the scene now uh, for many years, mm -hmm. and it'll be a, a treasure. It's going to be a treasure, I think. It will be, and I just hope that the younger generation will appreciate it. I know two boys that would really appreciate it because they're, they came over to the college wanting to look at the, the Blaine uh, information, the books and stuff, and so hopefully, I don't know if it's part of their thesis or what. I'm not sure if it, why they're doing it, mm -hmm. but uh, <clears throat> they seem very intent on learning about it, and that's the type of younger generation I appreciate, mm -hmm. you know, that wants to remember how to do things, because when I was also out there to my aunt's house, is we used to, the, the North Roundhouse was out there not too far from the old house, oh, really? mm -hmm. and I remember going to several dances at that North Roundhouse, but I remember also when I walk in the door, my aunt, my Auntie Tilden, who was my mother's grandmother and my grandmother's mother, <laughs> um, she, uh, when we walk in and if I, we'd be laughing, she'd tap us on the shoulder, you got to be quiet. And that's, that's one thing myself, my sisters, I had um, um, my younger sister and then my cousin, I claimed her as my younger sister too, she's deceased now. And my other younger sister, <laughs> she's also deceased. And uh, then I have two others, four other sisters that are, we're all cousins, but we call each other sister. Mm -hmm. But that's what's been instilled into us, you know, when you're at a, a tribal doing and people are talking, trying to tell you something, be quiet. If you don't be quiet, you will either get pinched or you will be tapped on the head, mm -hmm. you know. And that happened to me. I mean, I remember that. And I remember sitting by my Auntie Tilden and I couldn't say a word, or Grandma Nora, and she was the same way, you know, listen, and I'd have to listen, you know, but 
the bad thing about it is I didn't listen well enough to learn the language. And that's what I, I really regret in my life, is not learning that really well. You is know? there an effort to preserve the Pawnee language? Oh, yeah, they teach it at the, to the college. Do they? Mm -hmm. And they have some tapes and stuff. So, And I have those tapes, too, but I just I don't know where I packed them at. <laughs> I put things away, and then I can't remember where I packed them. Oh, well. <laughs> but I, my mother recorded my Auntie Tilden when they were... Uh, when uh, what do you call those cassettes. tape recorders came out? Yeah, cassettes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got the cassette at the house, but I don't have the recorder anymore. And I don't believe so. I have to go through her stuff again. And I really have never listened to it. But it would be neat if I could bring it down here, and you guys could listen to it. And well, if you'd like, we can certainly uh, not only uh, when we conclude this, we on our way down to go to the Pawnee Records downstairs, I'll show you our audio okay. area on this floor where they can take that cassette, mm -hmm. no matter how old it is, uh -huh. and they can, we have people who work with the tape first to clean it, mm -hmm. to make sure that it's going to be able to be uh, listened listen to. And then they can listen and make the necessary changes to get the crackling noises oh, yeah. out, any background noises that don't need to be in there, so right. they can enhance the voice quality. Wow. And it'll be much more uh, clearer, hopefully, uh, to uh, hear, and it can be put on a DVD. Wow. Uh, and listened to with higher fidelity than what was on the original. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can do that, and we'd be happy oh, to do that. Oh, that would be that. neat. That would be so neat. Because that way, because the standard in the old days when Martha was doing, she went from reel to reels, which is, uh, that was the standard. You had these huge reels of tape, mm -hmm. and we go through a big, heavy tape recorder right. to the cassettes. The cassettes didn't have the, well, they weren't as... as um, Clear? Well, they, they were uh, mass-produced, and they weren't as, as good quality as far as mm -hmm. the sound quality. You could get... You could get the information, but it was still, I mean, it's not superior mm -hmm. information as far as the sound quality. And so, but we can we can play with it and get it where it... That would be neat. And that way you would be able to have that information, because that, that would be, what, a treasure. Uh, yeah. To hear, to hear your, to hear, your grandma Tilden. Because when, well, to point it out, uh, to point something out is... Uh, my when my son and them got married in Las Vegas recently in June, and we came back the following weekend. We had a reception, and um, her, Melissa, my daughter-in-law, her grandmother was there, and she came over and sat by us. And my brother, she told my brother, "Oh, you're the barber, aren't you?" Like that, and he he was just shocked. You know, he said, "Man," and he told me later, he said, "Kay, that was so neat talking to an older Pawnee woman. He hadn't talked to anybody in a long time like that." And he was moved by it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and if I was to get that and we could hear Auntie's voice, I'm sure that would move him also. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we can make multiple copies too. Yeah. So, so you, he could have a copy of it as well. So, right. Because I'm sure he would want to listen to it at times, anytime he wanted to. Right. And uh, so keep that in mind and we'd be happy to work with you on that. And right. It would be something we'd be, be more than happy because that's. Our, our uh, mission is to, to collect, preserve, and share, and mm -hmm. what we, we can do to help preserve and share Correct. for you. And, and I never finished about my kids. I have... Oh, go ahead. I please. forgot. <laughs> I've inherited my sister who passed away, Mary Beth, her children. Um, there's Thomas, Richard, Erica, and Terrence. And then I have two stepsons, too. So there's four, five, six, seven, eight. I have nine kids. <laughs> And um, then I have like 14 grandchildren oh my. and two, one great grandson and soon to be a great granddaughter. Oh my. Mm -hmm. Quite yeah. an extended family. <laughs> yeah. I'm as anxious about the granddaughter. I hope she gets born on my birthday. What, but, well, now is this, um, <coughs> do they live mostly here in Oklahoma or are they most, yeah, some of them in the state? Mm, well, two of uh, the, uh, Erica and Richard, they live in uh, Montana. Mm -hmm. They're part Crow too. Okay. And so... And then Terrence and Thomas live in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Now, Risha, Lisa, my oldest, and my, my middle daughter, she, they live in Pawnee. 
and Brian lives in Ponca. And the stepsons live in, um, one lives in Drumright, one lives in Seminole. Yeah. Fairly close then. Mm -hmm. and it's yeah. nice to have family right there. Too. Right. And any time I need their help, all I got to do is holler at them. That's good. <laughs> I hope they come running real quick. Yeah, and two great grand, uh, two good son-in-laws. Uh, my youngest daughter's husband is really, he's really good to me. He takes care of her and he takes care of me. That's he just great. won't let me cut grass. <laughs> And I love to cut grass. Do you? Well, <laughs> oh yeah. Well, he, he, he's going above and beyond. <laughs> yeah, he is. So. But you know, that's like I said. I have fourteen grandchildren. Just enjoy them because I get to send them home after they visit me. <laughs> and the great grandkids too. Sure. So you know, I'm just anxious for this grand grand baby girl to be born. And uh, and, and she she's here in Oklahoma. Will be born in Oklahoma then. Yeah, I'll be. We'll go with her when she gets ready to have her. Okay. So it's probably being Cushing. Well, so. I, hope, I hope all the best for that. <clears throat> Me too. Yeah, it is. It'll be a happy occasion. It will be. I've enjoyed talking with you. Well, I have too, and I, I look forward I'll, to, uh, you know, anytime. And, and like I say, when you, you find that, uh, I'm sure you know you can find that cassette tape. Mm -hmm. We can make the, the transfer work. And it, takes real time, so if it's an hour long or for 30 minutes or 90 minute or 120, they had all these different uh -huh. type of uh, tapes, but it takes that length of time to be able to record it. But if we have to work on it to get the sound right. quality, it takes a little longer, so anyway, it won't, it won't well, be it, out of pocket too it's long. It's well worth the time because, I mean, I've had it, I mean, mom passed away in 2003, yeah, and um, I inherited, you know, her stuff because my sister didn't want to trash her house. <laughs> Little does she know she missed out on some stuff. And uh, so anyway, I've got that and I'm, you know, I'd like to have that. It would be well worth the time, you know, especially if it can be re-recorded onto. Oh, absolutely. And, mm -hmm. We have the equipment to do it. And and she and, and your grandmother, Tilton, Tilden, was the one that was 109? Mm -hmm. That's, she's my aunt. Oh. That oh. was. The aunt, okay. Yeah, it was my, she's the aunt, but she's the oldest one. She was the oldest one in our, our family that came. Well, I mean, she was the only one that came down from Nebraska. Maybe her, her husband did too, Ezra. I think Ezra, uh, well, Uncle she Ezra. she was recorded, she might have some very, very... I think she was mainly talking Pawnee too. Oh. I cannot remember what all mom asked her. Um, I just remember going out there. And she told her she wanted to record her so she could hear her voice or something to that effect. And so she started talking to her. But I don't remember what all she said or well, what she asked is, her. But if it is in Pawnee, maybe it, that, that uh, those who can translate it at the college or some other tribal elder could translate it mm -hmm. and then it could be re-recorded on another uh, tape of some kind. Of saying what they are saying. Or translate it or, or type out a transcription of what's yeah. on there. But yeah, just to hear her voice would be quite fantastic. Oh yes, it would be. Especially if she was born uh, in the 1870s or earlier. I think she was. And, yes. Uh, well, 109. You figure out how. Um, well, the 1860s then. Mm -hmm. She, if she made the removal in 1875, then she was born about 1866 then. Uh, and for some reason, I I recall mom saying that she was seven years old when she left Nebraska. So and it took them two years to get down here, a year and a half, something like that. Okay, so, uh, so if it was 1875 for the removal, then she was born 1868. Mm. Well, that's a still that's, that's a And you know, I never, I researched. I mean, not researched, but I looked <coughs> on the map in uh, north of Genoa. I would say about 30, 40 miles north of Genoa. There's a town called Tilden. And I don't know why, but I keep thinking, well, maybe this is where their village was. And maybe, you know, the white settlers named it Tilden. And maybe that's where they... That was also a presidential candidate by the name of Samuel Tilden. Maybe that's, for yeah, office At that time. And it's possible, because that was the transition period when they went from the uh, Indian names and they, the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs started uh, uh, requiring that... Um, for, I guess, ease of, of uh, record keeping to begin the anglicized names, and mm. they might have picked the name Tilden. Right, right. It's, it, it's speculation, mm. but it's possible.
but it's true. <laughs> and uh, so, and, and certainly by 1900, they were expected to have an anglicized name. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. many of them, uh, unfortunately, did. But we do have some, in, we do have some census records. With that, their Indian names? With their Indian names. Cool. I think I have hers. I had to do a family tree when I took the first um, Pawnee language class. Mm -hmm. And I had to do a family tree for that class. And I, I'm pretty sure I have her name, and I'm pretty sure I have her, her mother's and her father's yeah. all the way up. But I'd have to look again sure. and see. But um, Well, I think that would be, you know, and again, with the research materials that we have, I know we would be able to help you with some. With some that time. would be great. Well, that thank you be. again so oh, much. Yeah. I've enjoyed T it. T for Tiller. I, I will get it. T for, T for Tiller. Tiller. Okay. Just like T for two. T for two, okay. T I for just, Tiller. I'm just not, I'll, I'll let our resident expert here turn off the <laughs> <laughs> I've seen 